Okay. Thank you all very much for joining us tonight. Um, I want to welcome you to this presentation, which is uh, being provided to you by the Sash Bear Foundation. And we are so thrilled to have Dr. Christine Klinkoff with us. Um, just a couple of housekeeping notes firsthand before we get started. I wanna let you know that everyone in the audience tonight is muted and your cameras are automatically disabled. So you don't need to worry about what you look like or how much noise is happening where you are. Um, we will take some questions at the end of the presentation. And so you can put your questions into either the Q&A section or into the chat. And um, Kathleen, Barb, and myself will moderate the questions at the end. Um, I just want to let you know that we won't be able to get to all of the questions. There are always so many. Um, so we will go through them and curate the questions to uh, pose the ones to Dr. Klinkoff, which are the ones of the most uh, general interest to this audience and the most specific to the topic that she is speaking about, which is obsessive compulsive disorder and treatments. Um, so with that, um, I also, oh, I should also just remind you that the presentation will be recorded. So if you have to leave early, you will be able to watch the rest of it online. So with that, I would like to introduce Dr. Klinkoff, and she is a present, uh, a clinician who works at uh, Broadview Psychology, which is in Toronto, where I am, and they also have an office in Stouffville, Ontario, which is north of the city. She's a licensed clinical psychologist, and she works with adolescents, adults, and parents and families. Uh, she specializes in treating borderline personality disorder and obsessive compulsive disorder. She trained in New York and Philadelphia, and she has uh, worked in private practice, community health, and hospital settings. She developed an OCD group at Broadview Psychology, and in that role, she uses exposure and response prevention therapy and acceptance and commitment therapy, specifically to target obsessions and compulsions with people who have OCD. CD. So with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Klinkoff. We are so pleased to have you here with us tonight. Thank you for the intro, Doreen, and I'm very happy to be here. Um, so I will jump right into it and I'll share my slides. So the plan is, here we go, to just make sure everyone can see this. We're good. We're good. Okay, excellent. Okay, so the plan is um, I'll be presenting the topic for about 40 minutes and then afterwards we'll have I think, 20 minutes for questions. So, um, so I won't pause in the meantime to address questions. So yeah, the topic is how to support your loved one with OCD. So I know a lot of you are parents, caregivers, so I might sort of be using like kids, children, adolescents, you know, young adults, some of these terms interchangeably. So um, the agenda is I'll first provide some psychoeducation on OCD, and then we'll be talking about evidence-based treatment for OCD. And then because I specialize in treating borderline personality disorder, I'll talk about how treatment might differ a little bit when OCD is comorbid with uh, borderline personality disorder or emotion dysregulation and um, how to specifically support a loved one with OCD. So we'll talk about you know, what not to do and then what to do. So my hope is that you can leave this presentation with some, some concrete tools. Okay, so start off with a definition of, of OCD. So it involves the presence of obsessions, compulsions, or both. And I just wanted to highlight that because um, sometimes compulsions might be present without obsessions. So someone might engage in their rituals without the obsessive thoughts because they actually are trying to avoid experiencing some of those obsessive thoughts. And then, you know, typically what we're hoping for further along in treatment or as people, you know, start recovering from this is that they might just have the presence of obsessions, but not be engaging in the compulsions anymore. And then the second criteria is that the obsessions or compulsions are time consuming. 
So like they take more than one hour a day or they cause clinically significant distress or impairment in social, occupational, or other important areas of functioning. So that is, that's an important disclaimer as well, because I think, I think OCD is sort of like poorly understood and it can actually be incredibly distressing and impairing. And so like, you know, an example of maybe OCD that isn't such a big deal would be, let's say someone has intrusive thoughts about every time they fly, they have intrusive thoughts about the plane crashing and then they engage in some rituals like tapping or um, saying certain numbers over and over again, which reduces their anxiety. And maybe that takes about 10 minutes. And this would not really be impairing if that person flies like, you know, once every couple of months, right? It's, it's 10 minutes. It reduces distress. It's maybe not really interfering with um, friendships, with their functioning career-wise or school-wise. Um, now, if that person decided they wanted to become a pilot or um, a flight attendant, then it would cross over into this is actually pretty problematic because it's taking up a lot of time or getting in the way. Okay, so how does a thought become an obsession? So we, we have all experienced unwanted thoughts, taboo thoughts. Um, I think a pretty common one we could probably all relate to is standing on a really high building or by subway tracks and having the thought like, oh, I'm gonna like hurl my body over. And we might notice that thought and then be like, okay, well, that's weird and just move on. But a thought becomes an obsession when these two things are present. So one, distress is very high and two, there is very low openness to the thought. So a person wouldn't look at the thought and say, oh, you know, weird or how curious and, and just move on. It would be, what does... I really don't want to have this thought. And they might actually try to get rid of that thought, push it away, or even try to understand why am I having this thought? What does it mean about me that I'm having this thought, right? If I have the thought about pushing someone over the edge or throwing my own body over the edge, does it mean I'm homicidal or suicidal? Does it mean I'm a bad person? And that essentially is making the thought really relevant and you're, you're therefore kind of not open to it. Okay, so these are some of the common OCD subtypes. These are not, it's not an exhaustive list here, um, but these are some of the most common ones that show up. So harm OCD, harm OCD kind of involves um, thoughts around harming other people. Responsibility OCD that can look like, you know, feeling responsible for the safety of family members or pets. Um, it might involve checking rituals. So checking locks, the stove, making sure the pets haven't escaped. Um, relationship OCD involves obsessional thoughts about whether a relationship is right or wrong. And this is, this is different than just kind of thinking about, hey, is this person a good fit for me? It's, it has, it's very obsessive in nature. Um, contamination OCD, I'm sure we're all, we've all heard of this. This is sort of the most common one that people think of when OCD is mentioned. So sometimes people find it surprising that there are actually all these other subtypes. So contamination OCD, it's um, intrusive thoughts about getting sick or contaminated and that, you know, it, it might be um, fear of contamination of getting AIDS or HIV or cancer or um, now maybe even like COVID, right? So it, it can really vary. It's not just sort of like a general um, getting sick. So what's interesting about that is that I think a lot of people assumed that 
maybe the prevalence rates of contamination OCD would go up during the pandemic. Um, but for a lot of folks who had this already, it was really specific to something else. So it, it, it sort of went unaffected. Um, or they felt that they had a nice break from going out in the world and being exposed to things that might be contaminated. There's just right OCD, which involves um, having obsessive thoughts about wanting things to be a certain way and feeling very distressed when they are not in that order um, or not right in this way that they feel they should be. And this is this can get confused with perfectionism. It's um, just important to note that this is really, you know, it's really not adaptive. It's not, oh, this person's so organized and it just helps them function better. It's that when things aren't that way, it is very distressing um, and, and not functional, right? It can be impairing in these other life domains. Pedophilia OCD, kind of similar to harm OCD, involves intrusive thoughts about engaging in sexual acts with minors. And then there's religious OCD, also known as scrupulosity, which has to do with focus on um, morality and am I a bad person or doing right or wrong? And I'll also just kind of briefly say that because sometimes hearing about harm OCD or pedophilia OCD can be a bit jarring. And it's, it's very different from um, someone who actually wants to harm someone. Um, so the term we use, I think in psychology is like ego dystonic versus ego syntonic. One being like, this is like something I want. So it would be like high openness to thoughts and low distress if something's ego syntonic. If something is ego dystonic, it's like, I, I do not want this. I'm so distressed by this. And in my experience working with people with these subtypes of OCD, they tend to be some of the most gentle, kind people who like wouldn't even want to hurt a fly and end up actually avoiding people, places and things because they're so afraid that they might just lose control, act against their values and do something horrific, even though they've never done anything close to that. So, you know, I think sometimes it comes up like, do you need to do a harm, um, like a harm assessment or a risk assessment? And that's, that's not the case here. Okay, so some common obsessions. So it can look like intrusive thoughts, unwanted thoughts, repetitive thoughts, racing thoughts violent thoughts, sexual thoughts, blasphemous thoughts. And then compulsions are, so avoidance, that's, that's one that gets missed sometimes, but that absolutely is a compulsion. Reassurance seeking, so that might involve um, someone asking, you know, did you, like, are you sure the bad thing's not gonna happen? Did you see me lock the door this many times, um, right? Kind of asking others, or it could be um, kind of researching online, checking. So that would, that would be something like looking at the stove, making sure it's off or making sure the door is locked many times, hand-washing, excessive prayer, counting, um, comparison seeking, and then uh, excessive guilt. Okay, so this is just a little formulation I made to explain how OCD works. So um, on the far left, we have there are intrusive thoughts and obsessions. And so some examples could be like, this is, yeah, this is dirty. If I don't clean this, I will die. This is contaminated. Those thoughts lead to anxiety. And then the compulsions or rituals, um, which could be hand washing, avoiding repetitive behaviors, cleaning, those lead to a reduction in anxiety. And then the, the important part, which I was talking about before, is that this interferes with life. So it gets in the way of relationships with family, romantic relationships, school, et cetera. Okay, and then 
I know um, some some parents here also have uh, have loved ones with borderline personality disorder or emotion dysregulation. I thought I'd talk a little bit about that because I tend to treat um, OCD when it's comorbid with BPD. And so there are just maybe some slight differences. So the model looks very similar, but here at the top, there's you know people with um, BPD have a skills deficit in tolerating difficult emotions, right? Usually prior to starting treatment. And so what might happen is that they have intrusive thoughts, which leads to anxiety um, and, and maybe secondary to anxiety, guilt or shame. And because those emotions are so intense and they don't have the skills to be able to regulate them initially, that might lead to self-destructive behaviors that are used to reduce um, and avoid these intense emotions. Right? So some examples could be suicide attempts, self-harm. Um, self-harm could be used to regulate emotions or it could also be used as self-punishment. So for folks who have OCD that might involve a more taboo theme, it's actually pretty common for them to feel shame and um, self-harm can be used sometimes as self-punishment. Substance use, another way to um, kind of avoid um, or cope with emotions. And then there's sort of like disordered eating behaviors as well. So um, evidence-based treatments for OCD, so involve, uh, so there's exposure and response prevention, and that is sort of a gold standard of OCD treatment. So that involves building a hierarchy of sort of like things that that person fears and then um, reducing the compulsions and ideally getting to a place where they're not engaging in the compulsions. So um, you're, you're really taking a gradual approach and on that hierarchy, you're rating like out on a scale from let's say zero to hundred, what is their level of distress if in this particular situation, right? So if you were to touch this table that you view as contaminated, what is your level of distress? And then the response prevention piece is, what are you currently doing as a ritual? And how are we going to reduce that in a way that you are going to feel uncomfortable? Then acceptance and commitment therapy, um, that involves this more kind of mindfulness. So, we are, instead of doing maybe exposure work, are learning to notice and observe thoughts. And along with the mindfulness piece, clients are also asked to identify what their values are. So what, what do they care about? What's important to them? And in what ways is OCD taking them away from their values? And so, um, you're basically helping them to engage in value-based behaviors instead of mood-based behaviors by observing thoughts and making them sort of less relevant. And ACT and ERP actually go really well together. So I, I tend to use both. So we'll do, um, we'll do exposures and then we'll talk about, you know, how eventually to, manage thoughts through like an acceptance and mindfulness approach. And again, yeah, the group at Broadview, we've been able to sort of like nicely um, fit in both of those. And then I just wanted to name that medications can also be pretty helpful to manage OCD. So specifically uh, SSRIs, so selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, which are you know generally prescribed for depression they seem to be um, pretty effective in treating moderate to severe OCD, of course, in conjunction with ERP or ACT. So not, not so much as a standalone because then that person might not really learn the skills to be able to manage this on their own. And they're just kind of relying on something external. So in uh, moderate to severe cases, it can be really helpful to combine the two. Okay. 
And then how does treatment differ when OCD is comorbid with BPD? Um, so there are some things to consider. So in DBT, we have specific um, hierarchies, so treatment hierarchies. So we have life interfering behaviors that we will always address first. We have treatment interfering behaviors and then quality of life interfering behaviors. So in that order, we, we address what's coming up. And so um, a person's like OCD symptoms may fit under life interfering for one person, but might be more of a quality of life target for someone else. So for example, if let's say someone has intrusive thoughts about harming others and then they feel very distressed and they self-harm as a way to regulate their emotions, that's gonna fall under life interfering behaviors. So it wouldn't be that effective to just treat um, the self-harm in a vacuum but to understand where it's coming from and to at the same time do some um, ERP or ACT treatment. Then there are times where OCD might be treatment interfering. So maybe if um, rituals are so time consuming that it's making the client like late for sessions um, or if we're asking them to come in for in-person sessions and they're not willing to because of uh, the fear of contamination, that's something we would wanna address as like a, a secondary target. And then there might be folks where um, they don't actually have any life interfering behaviors or treatment interfering behaviors, but OCD is getting in the way of their quality of life. So if they are a DBT client, we might actually wait for them to be done the full eight months of group and individual DBT to then move on to that as like a secondary target. Because most people who come into DBT have either these life interfering behaviors or treatment interfering behaviors. Okay. So now we're gonna jump into the um, part about what not to do. And then we'll go into what to do when you have a loved one with, with OCD. So accommodation. Um, so accommodation, you know, it involves making OCD comfortable through modifying our behaviors to accommodate the OCD sufferer. So it's, you know, essentially reacting to OCD symptoms in a way that undermine therapeutic goal of risk-taking and tolerating discomfort, because that's ultimately what we're trying to do. That's the goal of ACT or ERP is um, we want the client to learn that, yes, these things are really, it's really uncomfortable when they don't engage in the compulsions. It's really uncomfortable when they do the exposure practice and they're able to tolerate it. Right. And it, so we're kind of pushing them to take risks and to learn tools to be able to tolerate that discomfort. OK, so before going into what accommodation can look like, I just want to acknowledge, you know, the many reasons why caregivers might accommodate their loved ones, because it actually like makes makes a lot of sense and is not helpful. So. One might be like in response to feeling distraught, hopeless, helpless, or worried. It could be just, I'm, I'm like following my instincts, right? My loved one is distraught and this is something that I can do to help. And another could be to avoid a negative reaction, right? An anger outburst or even, you know, destructive behavior from your loved one. I think that's a big one that tends to come up is like, well, I'm going to see a big, behavior burst from my, my kid. And that's really scary. And sometimes these bursts are, you know, very, very concerning. Um, so that's, that's maybe something that people want to avoid. We know that maybe accommodation can provide short-term relief, even though it isn't effective for the long-term goals. And then maybe it might give you a sense of control in a situation that feels totally out of control, right? That, like I said, OCD is hard to understand. 
And here's a way where you can do something to help in the short term. Okay, so a type of way one might accommodate is providing reassurance. So that might look like, you know, convincing your loved one that an obsessive thought or fear is false or it's not, it, it won't happen, right? So don't worry, you're not gonna get sick if you touch the table, don't worry. Um, no one's going to break in if you, you didn't do this ritual or, you know, yes, I, I did see you lock the door or in the case of more scrupulosity or harm OCD of like saying, of course, you're a good person. I know that you would never hurt anyone. You've always been such a sweetheart. Um, or yeah, I'm, I'm sure the stove is off, right? So by doing this, you're lessening your loved one's anxiety in the short term, but you're also feeding into that cycle of OCD inadvertently. Okay, avoidance is another way um, we might accommodate. So that might look like not engaging in your regular routine out of fear that you might trigger your loved one, right? So maybe it's like, ooh, like I don't, I'm not going to watch this movie in front of them because like the content relates to their OCD or I'm worried about triggering them or oof, this like newspaper article that's about this like homicide that happened is going to be really triggering for my kid who has harm OCD. So I'm going to hide it. Um, I, or maybe there's a topic of conversation that you're avoiding altogether because you don't want them to be uncomfortable. Right. Or even like engaging in additional checking or cleaning that you wouldn't do if, if you're alone. Okay. Participating in time consuming rituals. So this, this might involve, you know, helping with the, the rituals. So you're helping with checking. Let me check the, that the plugs upstairs are unplugged and that the stove is off. Um, or, you know, this, this happens a lot when you know, you're living together and one person gets really consumed with their rituals. Sometimes it just feels easier to say, let me help you with this, right? Or like, I'll clean the wall because you clean the walls every day. And that therefore, right, you, you get to leave faster and, you know, you're not as distressed. And yet in this situation as well, you are strengthening that ritual and the OCD. Okay. Making excuses for loved ones. So if um, maybe a loved one is acting against family values, so maybe they're, they're late or they're avoiding commitments due to their ritualizing, they've quit their job, they've dropped out of school, and you kind of like justify or explain that avoidance, um, that might be another way that you're, you're accommodating the OCD. Okay. Modification of your work, family, or social responsibilities and routines. So like maybe not inviting people over because you, you know, your, your loved one will be really preoccupied about how the house is now contaminated, um, right? Refraining from interacting with people or going to places that are OCD triggers, right? So it's just kind of like, I'm like deliberately changing your schedule or routine to um, sort of like, as to not um, put your loved one in a situation where they feel distressed. Okay, so we've talked about some of the things not to do uh, and what to do instead. So I will go over kind of three specific um, Area. So one is validation. The second is balancing acceptance and change. And then the third is collaborative problem solving. Okay. Oops. Okay. Yeah. Validation. So what is validation? So we talk about this a lot in DBT. Um, Validation is acknowledging someone's emotional experience. It's accepting their emotional experience. It doesn't mean that you agree that their reaction makes sense, 
agree that their level of distress is reasonable for what's going on. It is simply, yeah, just accepting that it's there. And so it might be saying something like, I see you're having a really hard time and that makes sense, right? It makes sense given they have OCD, maybe if they're doing some new exposure practices, you're recognizing that they're doing something that's really hard for them and they're anxious, right? Or, you know, maybe if they're, they seem really like stuck, that's also something you can observe. So validation is not, it's not agreeing. It's not right. Supporting the feelings or thoughts that are out of proportion. And one thing it really isn't is problem solving or fixing. And I know this can be a hard one for caregivers to move away from a role of fixing or problem solving, because essentially if you're validating, you're not giving any tips around what it is they can do. You're simply noticing that that distress is there. And that is actually really valuable in itself. Right. And I think it's important to remember, right. You're, not the therapist um, and probably what they need is maybe comfort, acceptance, acknowledgement that this is hard. So validation is really important because yeah, like I said, it communicates acceptance um, and it can actually help regulate emotions. So, you know, if you're feeling, imagine like you're feeling really upset about something and someone immediately goes into like, what can we do to fix this? Um, it just might not help you regulate that emotion. I mean, initially, if someone says, I can see that you're really sad or it makes sense that you're sad, um, or they're even commenting on like your nonverbals that would indicate sadness, that can intensify the emotion initially, but it also can help you kind of move through that. Um, it helps also open the door to self-compassion and can reduce shame and self-blame. So that's, that's often a big piece because um, a lot of people with OCD experience a great deal of shame about their OCD themes. So we want to work to like, you know, destigmatize that and use, yeah, use compassion and understanding. So validation is one step towards, I want to understand what's going on, or I see that this is hard. Okay. So in addition to validation, there's this balance of acceptance and change that is very um, important and can be quite supportive. We talk about this a lot in, in DBT and um, the phrase we often use is you're doing the best that you can and you can do better. So, you know, the idea is that if we are heavy on the only accepting what's going on, then that might be inadvertently communicating there's really, this is just how things are and, and you can't change. Um, and that could be really discouraging sometimes. However, if we're too unbalanced on the change front where it's, you need to do better, this isn't okay, we need to see changes, that can be pretty invalidating, right? The opposite of validating, which is kind of saying, yeah, you need to be doing something differently. It might not be acknowledging, well, where are you right now? How did you get here? And, you know, we want to work towards changing, but in a way that is gradual. Um, and in order for it to be manageable change, we have to really sort of accept and acknowledge where that person is right now. Okay. And then, the last one is to engage in collaborative problem solving. So for this, I mean, ideally um, your, your loved one is connected with a therapist who has experience or is, is treating their OCD with ERP or ACT or a combination of that. 
and can bring you in to kind of let you know what it is that they're working on and how you can support them. Now, I realize, I think we were talking even before this presentation that wait lists are so long right now, it's a disaster. And sometimes your, you know, your child or your young adult might really not want to bring you into a therapy session. Um, so if it's, if it's possible, um, it would be ideal to be able to collaboratively identify a problem area to work on together. So, you know, for example, that problem area might be reducing checking behaviors, right? In order to be able to tolerate uncertainty. And then you'd even want to be more specific about that. Okay. So this is something that's really getting in the way of your life and your relationships and your ability to work. And it's super time consuming, you know, so what do we want to work towards? So maybe now checking is, you know, looking like doing the locks like 60 times. And perhaps a goal would be to reduce that number of checking to 30, right? So um, that would be a great target where you're specific and there are probably other things that are going on, but you don't want to be too intense about that approach where it's like, I'm going to, we're going to like reduce the locks and then the checking of the stove and then this. So making it more manageable. And then, so that's kind of ideally you're coming up with it together. Um, maybe it's not so collaborative but either way. Um, it'd be important for you as a caregiver to kind of communicate what you might be doing differently. So you might say like, I've, I've realized that I'm kind of accommodating your OCD and that's not helpful in the long run. And so I've decided that I am going to reduce how often I give you reassurance. So before coming up with a specific this is what I'm going to do differently. It could be helpful to do an assessment of like just, just writing down, like how often am I actually providing reassurance? How often am I accommodating in this way? And then that might be something to gradually decrease. So maybe you say, I will re give you reassurance once, or I'm actually not going to give you reassurance anymore. Um, or instead of giving you reassurance, I am going to ask you, do you want to um, give into your OCD or do you want to be skillful right now? Right. So that that's kind of another option that you're, you're removed from like a, a coach role and you're bringing it to their attention that they have these options. They have these choices, right? Cause it can often feel an OCD that the person doesn't have a choice and, and yet they do. Um, so you are helping to extinguish the behavior right, through shaping. So even in ex exposure and response prevention, we're often, we're not going from, you know, these extensive compulsions to nothing at all. When we start the exposures, right? You're gradually decreasing either the amount of time, um, spent doing that compulsion, the number of times, you're right checking or doing whatever ritual. Um, and, and eventually we're getting that down to zero or a place where it's really not functionally interfering. So just an idea of maybe something you could say instead of accommodating OCD would be like, I can no longer help you feed the OCD. Right? You're learning not to feed it. So let's not allow it to win this time. And you can pair that with validation. And then another thing I would add here is you might, if you do have um, a loved one who's willing to be collaborative, I would also add in some rewards. So if you are able to meet this goal or you're able to like, yeah, to manage after a week, then you get a gift card or we can go out for this meal together, right? And kind of celebrating that success. So, and, and of course, providing like praise, um, 
because that's reinforcement along the way and just acknowledging that, wow, you're working really hard and you're, yeah, you're doing an amazing job. So that, I think I, yeah, got through, got through that so that we have time for questions because I know there will be a lot of questions. There are indeed. And now that you have said you're ready for questions, uh, yeah. there will be a lot more come in. This always happens. Okay. Um, so great. Um, first of all, I'm going to go right back to the beginning and I'm going to ask you to clarify um, your description of harm OCD, because oh, sure. I noticed a few questions about uh, does it overlap with self-harm? Is self-harm part of harm OCD? Um, and, and so maybe you could just start again from the beginning with that particular description. Absolutely. Okay. So yeah, so harm OCD, it's, um, involves like in, intrusive thoughts about harming other people. So it might be like, you know, an, an invasive thought where you're like stabbing a loved one, um, or using like a, a different weapon to hurt someone. And it is not necessarily like tied to self-harm at all. It might be just in the case of like when I was talking about OCD being comorbid with BPD, or maybe someone might experience anxiety and then shame. And then as a way to regulate those emotions might self-harm, but that's also um, something a person with OCD might do even with different subtypes of OCD. So it's, I think I used that as an example, but it, it can be with any other subtype. I hope that, I hope that clarified yeah. that. And I'll, I'll toss in a few examples of what I think are harm OCD yeah, that yeah. I observed in my own child. Once we, once we knew that they were dealing with OCD, um, one thing was that they found it almost impossible to take the subway because they were afraid that they would push somebody yeah. onto the tracks. Um, and not that they wanted to do this, that was, you know, and it was yeah. incredibly distressing for them to have this enter their mind as a possibility. Um, and another, at another point, they did come to us at one point and ask if they had tried to stab us because they were having all these intrusive thoughts about, uh, about yeah. stabbing us. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, um, can I just follow on that and say, is it really common for people to have multiple types of OCD. Cause when I think back to my, yeah. my kids presentation, it like, I don't know if it went from one thing to another, or if they had all these different things happening at once and we just weren't aware of it, but yeah. how does all that tie together? It is, it is very common to either jump around from one side type to the other, or to have a few that are present at once. And then, you know, in treatment, we often think about like, I don't know, what do we want to prioritize? What's the most impairing right now? Because with, you know, with OCD, it's sort of this alarm signal that goes off that, you know, you need to pay attention to this thing when we, it's sort of like a, an overactive amygdala, a part of your brain that's implicated in the fight or flight response. And so when maybe one OCD subtype gets resolved or you get sick of it, then your brain's like, wait a second, but what about this thing? So it can jump around. The good news is though that um, with the treatment for OCD, it can gen it can be generalized to other types. So, um, so some people, you know, once they've done a full sort of like ERP, then they have other subtypes that come up, but they have a sense of what they can do to manage that. Right. Okay. Yeah. So it, it's um, so it's transferable. They're transferable skills that they're learning. Yeah, because it's it's about experiencing the distress, right? Kind of noticing the thoughts and instead of like getting fused and stuck with the thoughts, it's acting in value congruent ways, right? So that's, I mean, it, it, it's common it, It's common for people to sort of like come back into treatment as a refresher when new th things pop up because the exposures might be a little bit different. Um, so, yeah, and I'll also just, I think that was really helpful to provide your own personal example of Doreen and, um, for, for harm OCD, I've, I've seen where, you know, people 
won't, won't have any knives in their home or anything that could be like a weapon because they're so afraid that they might just I like have this loss of control and hurt someone that they really care about. Mm-hmm. So actually some of the exposures I'll do is like have that, that weapon in session with us and we'll just, yeah, just kind of sit there with it and it'll be really distressing and you know what, I'm still alive. So yeah. Mm-hmm. So a lot of this uh, um, is about learning to tolerate that distressing experience and how uncomfortable it is exactly. for the person, right? Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Um, so a lot of questions I'm seeing as well are, are coming up where they, they may be OCD, but they may not be. So how do you tell the difference? And one example is um, where somebody really exercises to excess. Would that be considered anorexia or could that be a type of OCD? And as a family member, how would you kind of try to determine what it, what might be the underlying cause and how is best to respond? Yeah. Yeah. Great question. And I guess it would, you know, depend on like, what is the function of the exercise? Is it something that a person is doing because they feel good when they exercise and are they're doing it as a way to like, you know, socialize with others. And they got really into marathons or is it in response to having, you know, distressing thoughts about something bad happening? And is that a compulsion? Um, now probably just kind of going to that treatment hierarchy piece, if that excessive exercise was actually dangerous, that's something that we would prioritize. Um, and, and of course, trying to understand it better. Is this like, is this happening because a person wants to be thinner or is this happening because a person is so distressed by their thoughts that they are engaging in exercise as a compulsion? Um, and either way, we'd probably want to, unless it's like just really healthy, but it sounds as if that's not the case here, we would um, probably try and get them to use other coping skills to manage or right, reduce the amount of time they're engaging in that. So as a family member, trying to sort of figure out maybe what yeah. what's the purpose or the desired outcome of it, yeah. um, you have to be in a place where you can have that open conversation with them. Is this something that, um, like how young would a child be, um, and really be able to articulate it, Mm -hmm. I guess. And, and what do you need to do as a family member to help them open up and have that conversation with you? So you have a better sense of what's going on. Yeah. Yeah. Great question. Cause I think it can be hard, like for, really young kids to be able to articulate what is going on for them when they're maybe engaging in all these ritualistic behaviors, right? And that's maybe only language that they're able to use later on. Um, But I think one way to be able to start understanding is just like providing observations, right? Non-judgmental observations, or I, I noticed that you're, you're doing this and just being curious and open rather than coming at it from a place of judgment or even like, even if you are concerned, I think sometimes coming in of like, I'm so worried about this might not be the most helpful approach. So that's maybe one way to gather more information and just try to try to understand and be compassionate around what's going on so that you can figure out what, yeah. What are the next steps here? Okay. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Um, another question that's come up a few times is around therapy. So just a, a, maybe a two-parter, um, you talked about both ERP, which is exposure and response pr- prevention, right? And um, ACT, acceptance and commitment therapy. So are there ages at which this is is appropriate? Like how young could somebody engage in some of these treatments? And if they're resisting treatment, my goodness, how do you get them into it? (laughs) That question, the age old question that all parents have. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. You know, ERP is something that you can start pretty early on. Um, I don't, I don't work with young kids, but I know a lot of my colleagues do. And I think we've had like, you know, 
even the five-year-olds who do some form of ERP. Now it's going to look a little different and the language will be different. And you really have a ton of parental involvement with, with ERP um, with a, with a five-year-old versus someone who's a bit older, but yeah, early intervention is the best. And then, oh, treatment resistant. Yeah. That, that is tough and happens all the time because people don't want to be uncomfortable. And we're also doing like, we're really leaning into something that is so challenging. So if we, we think of like harm OCD, you're essentially helping the person tolerate the uncertainty that, yeah, that might happen. Like we're not, we're not telling them, we're not giving them the reassurance that you'll, you'll never hurt anyone. You will never do that. Right. We're saying you might, and, and maybe I might too. And we have to, is, is that possibility that's so small, is that going to kind of get in the way of your life worth living goals? So, I mean, I think timing is important. Some people it's just not, they're just simply not willing to work on it at a particular time. And, um, it's not something that can be forced. So I think that that can be really hard as a caregiver to see, like my kid is struggling with this and yet they're not willing to, but then there's also, you know, the impact you can have, which is in thinking about how can I support my kid? How can I not accommodate their OCD? And how do I encourage them to be in situations that are uncomfortable and then hopefully eventually get them to a place where they're willing to do treatment. Okay. Um, So is it possible for someone to really not understand that what they're dealing with is OCD because it, it makes so much sense in their own mind? Yeah. Well, I think with, Definitely. I mean, there's, like I said, OCD is so poorly understood. And I think a lot of people think of contamination fears as this, this is what OCD is, or there's some confusion that it's more around, like it's more perfectionistic type of behavior. So yeah, I think there's some people who have these distressing thoughts and then think, oh my God, this means something about me. And Um, I've heard so many times from clients who they finally, after, you know, years maybe come across an article where, oh, this is what I'm dealing with. And so you can imagine, I mean, now with, with the internet, like that's one of maybe the positives of having access to information is it might be a little easier to figure that out, but yeah, people who maybe don't go out of their way to do that research might really be suffering and and not sure. Um, And I think, unfortunately, um, you know, even some treatment providers don't have, may not know exactly what's going on sometimes too, and might do some harmful accommodation as well. Right. Or just say like, no, you're not going to, you're not going to do that. Don't worry. And that's, Mm -hmm. can can sort of like feed into the, the OCD cycle. Mm-hmm. And, and I, I have to share another personal story yeah. because, um, we had at one point, uh, a psychiatrist doing an assessment with our child, um, before we knew about the, the OCD that they were mm-hmm. dealing with. And, um, the, the psychiatrist said, well, your child is really uncooperative and not interested in, in working with me at all, because, you know, the kid's sitting there with their arms crossed and they're looking beyond, beyond the psychiatrist at the wall behind them. And they're just like, they're not engaging. So they're not interested in getting better or, or working with me. And then, you know, years later, it came out from my child that they were looking at the clock on the wall behind the psychiatrist, waiting for the second hand to get to a certain number. And then they could speak when the, when it got to a certain number, but before that point, they weren't able to, but you know, the psychiatrist had approached this with a a judgment and a lack of curiosity. And there was a missed opportunity for us to have discovered what was going on. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. yeah. (laughs) But, and, and that's how, how secretive it is in many ways, right? Like my child would never have mentioned that to me until I asked even years For later. sure. Yeah. And I've experienced before, like, you know, being in a session with someone and they're 
engaging in all kinds of compulsions that are more like mental rituals that I can't see or even really subtle ones. And it hasn't been till much later on in their treatment that they're like, by the way, I'm doing this all the time. Mm -hmm. And it's the relationship needs to be there for a person to feel like, okay, I'm not going to be judged or this is a safe space, which is why it's really important to approach it. Yeah. Non-judgmentally and with curiosity. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Um, just following on the question with the both treatment modalities that you use, um, is there um, a way for family members or, or individuals to know what training, you know, is it important that somebody have a certain level of training in order to do these therapies? Um, what, yeah. would, what would we look for as a family member looking for services? Yeah, that's, that is a good question. I mean, there's, there's not like a particular, I think, level of, of training. I mean, I think I would just kind of get an understanding of like how they've used ERP before, um, how they became familiar with it. Are they being supervised by someone who knows it? Um, just, you know, I think generally people who might say like, I'm familiar with ERP and, this is what's needed to treat, you know, your, your child's OCD. That's hope, you know, hopefully enough. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think just asking more questions and under maybe understanding even, are they, do they use a particular manual? Have there been any, um, how long have they been doing that for? Okay. I don't know how helpful that is, but it's hard to, it's hard to know. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. It really, it really is. Yeah. <laughs> I, hope, I hope that when people say, I know what I'm doing and I'm skilled and act in ERP, that that's true. Mm -hmm. Well, I know I, one thing, you know, is just to find out how experienced they are in terms of what how many clients they've had and how successful they, they may have been, right? which is a reasonable question to ask. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm going to turn to Kathleen and Barb and see if you have, I know you do have some questions that you would like to have uh, Dr. Klinkoff address, and then we'll have to close very soon because it's almost eight o'clock. Wow, so yeah. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Doreen. I do have one question here um, that's been kind of going back and forth. So how to stop difficult interactions or fights with a loved one when their obsessions is reviewing and overanalyzing each word and action, the behavior that a parent does. Oh, okay. I thought maybe validation would fit in there, but it's not quite enough. So if you could expand. Yeah, yeah, right. So if I'm understanding correctly, a lot of the, so the OCD, compulsion has to do with analyzing the parents actions and behaviors. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I might want to think about, are there, are there ways that the, the caregiver can like remove themselves when that's happening? Um, definitely validation of like, you know, I'm, I'm noticing this must be a really hard moment for you, like observing what's happening. And that might be a good opportunity to come up with some kind of um, collaborative plan of, you know, having, I think it's appropriate for the parent to say that this is what it's like for me when, when you kind of, when you like ha have your compulsions and this is how I'm going to react differently. And maybe even kind of coming up with rewards or reinforcement for doing less of that. And would that help to eliminate the, the circling of the conversation that it just goes spiraling through? I mean, hopefully, hopefully that would be a goal. Um, but I think, I think sometimes it might warrant, yeah, the parent removing themselves, just recognizing that this isn't effective Right? Because with OCD, it's, it's like the more that you engage with it, the, the bigger it becomes. And um, it's not, you know, some of the most intelligent people have OCD and yet it's not something you can like logically work your way out of. So if we focus more on 
this is like, yeah, this is a hard moment for you. Let me get you an ice pack so that you can regulate your emotions that way, or let me get you some tea, but not engage with the content. Okay. Okay. That makes sense to me. Hopefully that answers the question for the participant. Um, the other big question that I have here is how does self-harm regulate emotions? Yeah. Good question. And, and I say, when I said self self-harm to regulate emotions, also, hopefully I stressed it's a, um, a maladaptive behavior that we definitely target in treatment. Um, that is pretty destructive. So, well, it. I mean, in, in a few ways, one, it can be that the physical pain um, actually distracts from some of the emotional pain. Um, some people report that there is like a, a calming cathartic feeling when they see blood. And it's it's a very intense sensation that's hard to replicate with other things, right? So when distress is really, really high, that's something that can feel like a release. Okay. Yeah. Well, do we have time for one more small one? It might be a small one. Um, it's regarding cannabis. And I just lost my question. Sorry, one second. Matt. How effective are alternative medicines like cannabis for OCD? Yeah, you know what? I actually don't know. Um, I know SSRIs are pretty effective. And I think with cannabis, it depends, you know, like um, I think it in some ways can be problematic as it can lead to avoiding emotions and not fully experiencing emotions, but I'm sure there's for, for some people, maybe a certain quantity or way that you're using it that actually is effective. Um, but I think it really would be case by case and wouldn't be something I would recommend as a, you know, as a treatment for OCD, but I also don't want to like overly pathologize it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank it you works so for some people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that's what we understand. And it's a, it's a common question. So I just thought yeah. we should, should take a little peek at it. Thank you yeah. so much for answering those questions, Doreen. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'm, I want to leave on a hopeful note. Um, there are a number of people asking, um, what are the outcomes for people who receive one of these evidence-based treatments like ERP or ACT? Yeah. Well, they are generally very promising. Um, there's a lot of research that indicates that people do learn to cope and live with their OCD and have very functional lives after engaging with these treatments. So if a person is willing and, um, you know, engages in this evidence-based work, then yeah, they, I mean, then the outcome is, is excellent. I've, I've seen it myself. Um, I know a lot of my colleagues have as well. So hopefully that instills some hope. Yeah. 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 And I can say again, from my personal experience, yeah. watching my kid grow up after, after treatment and after years of, of practicing, uh, using the skills at one point, they said, you know, there are days when I almost forget that I have OCD. Amazing, <laughs> which was just the the most heartwarming uh, thing to hear. So oh, yeah, and I certainly see a difference in their in their ability to function in day to day life. So oh, fantastic! Right. Love hearing that. Right. <laughs> Yeah. So I want to thank you again for having been here. I want to thank Barb and Kathleen for having helped me with this uh, moderating of the q and I thank Lynn for being here. Lynn is the co-founder of the Sash Bear Foundation, and she has been here as well with us. Um, for those of you whose questions we did not get to, some of them refer specifically to borderline personality disorder. And so I would just remind you that you can go to our website and find a number of 
of other presentations that have been recorded on the topic of borderline personality disorder and dialectical behavior therapy, which Dr. Klinkoff also referred to. Um, and Dr. Klinkoff has uh, very graciously agreed to share her slide deck and also has put together a list of suggested resources, including some websites, podcasts, that kind of thing. So um, Kathleen and Barb are going to put an email address into the chat and people can email us at programadmin at sashbear.org. And we will send out to anyone who wants it, the slide deck and the resource list. Um, and I'm sorry that we did not manage to get to everyone's questions, but I, I know that um, this has been extremely helpful and really, really interesting to me. Um, we've also recorded this presentation so you could go back and watch it again. And hopefully maybe on a, a second watching, some of your questions will be answered. Um, so once again, thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Klinkoff. This was really, really wonderful. Thank you, it was my pleasure.